So if he's making you host, Dave, you should be able to. Yeah, we're live now. Okay, good. So greetings to everybody. We're sorry for the technical difficulties here, <laughs> but uh, please bear with us. We've got an exciting topic to go with today. Um, and uh, our wonderful host, Mark Jeffrey, was going to get on and introduce us. Um, but uh, in the absence of Mark, we'll just jump in here. Uh, I'm on with my dear friend and one of my partners, Noel Walsh in Ireland. I'm Dave Fish. Uh, I was the tennis coach at Harvard for 42 years and 44 total uh, as an assistant and, and have been involved with the development of, of uh, level-based play worldwide for the last nine years, first through Universal Tennis um, UTR uh, and uh, later through our efforts with this global tennis tour. Um, and it's our opportunity to talk to you a little bit about historically what's gone on that worked in tennis before, that many, many of the characteristics that were so productive in tennis before um, uh, have been sort of dismantled and don't, don't work anymore. And uh, the subject of our talk today is how can we begin to grow tennis again Postcode by postcode, or in the United States, zip code by zip code. Uh, and, and so uh, it, it's, it's a fascinating topic, and we thought we'd just go into a little bit of, of historical data um, that talks about the, 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 the uh, between the white lines essentially is a forum now that we have for discussing ideas on a global level that have affected tennis. Um, and, um, and we hope to add to the conversation that federations have largely been responsible for curating in the past. Um, we note that, uh, that it's really private sector inspirations that have really dri driven innovations in tennis, whether it was Philippe Chartrier uh, 60 years ago, creating the French, um, pro the very productive French system and Tennis Europe, whether it was the change from shamateurism, um, to open tennis, whether it was tie breaks, no ad scoring, fast forward tennis, uh, the first satellite tours were designed by the players for the players. The ATP tour was a breakaway from the players to boycott at Wimbledon. The WTA tour was started by Billie Jean King uh, against the best wishes and advice uh, uh, of the USTA. So historically, all the change has come from outside and it's made tennis better in so many ways but we'd like to examine how it hasn't made tennis better in so many ways. Um, and, uh, and we just talked to historically, many of, the, many of the best development systems in the world came through local, what, let's call it metropolitan or city-sized efforts. Um, um, historically, and it, many of you won't know this, but I'm sure there are many international examples, but St. Louis, Missouri in the United States produced 20, 30, 40 world-class players during the 1960s. And they had a, it was a wonderful sort of highly generative, they would play with each other and develop each other. And it's that local opportunity to compete without leaving home while you have a life um, that has been so productive for tennis and which has been largely erased over the last 30 years since players had to begin chasing points, whether it was ITF junior circuit points, whether it was USTA junior circuit points, uh, whether it was ATP or WTA circuit points. And essentially our, our premise is that all the very productive circuits around the world, what used to be amateur circuits, in India there was a, a marvelous circuit for two months in the winter, uh, in the Pacific Northwest in the United States, Players went and became world-class players with that great competition locally. It was affordable, et cetera. And those have all largely disappeared now. And so we're, we're going back to examine a way to return to the past in a way to capture some of the wonderful um, um, uh, elements of the tennis, but also use new technology like these global rating systems like Universal Tennis um, and any other systems that may come on board soon. But the opportunity now is to bring tennis back local. As you can see, our tagline here is uh, bringing tennis home. And we'd like to go into some of the principles that, uh, that can make a much stronger tennis village, that can make it possible for more of the people 
in, in an entire metropolitan area to get affordable level-based competition on a regular basis and how we can use our best pros who right now are having trouble making a living at all, wondering whether they should stay in the game, uh, giving them opportunities to make a more respectable living at the same time that they are driving in, uh, this local development efforts all over the world. And as Mark Jeffrey, who's just joined us, uh, can chime in, um, Mark has uh, been instrumental in it, sort of envisioning how we might all work together here. Mark, I'd like to welcome you. Can you hear us now? If I can, welcome. Little yes. technical glitch, but all is well. <laughs> and lovely, having a cup of tea, the actual perfect gentleman to kick off the second day. And as I was going to say, you were one of the very first in. You are instrumental in, in Between the White Lines, what it is. In its inaugural day after four months. Uh, and my final thing to say that as our tagline is building, post, building tennis postcode by postcode, it's very appropriate for you to pose the question of the challenges of doing just so. So yeah. welcome to everybody and everybody's in for a treat. Wonderful. And thanks to, from all of us, Mark, for your efforts along with Emma and your great team. So uh, as I said yesterday, this is kind of the TED Talks for tennis. And uh, just, just going to get TED talks. We'll Make them shorter TED Talks. Great, great. So thank you very much for jumping. I'd like to... Dave, uh, can, you, can you hear me uh, in the background there? Yes, please, No. Fantastic. Okay, that's great. I just wanted to compliment you on the run through there on those uh, historical moments in the past. Uh, many people, you know, like uh, of the younger generation, let's say the 20, 30 year olds, they may not be aware of some of these issues that came up in tennis in the past. And of course, we worry uh, normally about the things that we're most familiar with, which is the day to day of life. Um, how do you see the, the historical issues or challenges that tennis has had uh, building, uh, you know, tennis worldwide? How do you see them? Have they changed or are they very similar issues? And why is that? Why haven't they changed in all this time? Yeah, well, I, th I think essentially we have to understand what federations and tennis organizations that are responsible for sort of overseeing the growth of tennis. Um, they're, they're essentially administrative bodies. And the administrative bodies tend to like to keep things pretty much the same as long as you can keep everybody in order and keep the trains running on time. That's a, that's a good thing. Um, but unfortunately, it causes us never to sort of to sit back and take a 30,000 foot view on what is the experience like for our consumers. So while the, the administration of tennis worldwide has, has worked from an administrative point of view and makes sense and you can chart it out, from the user point of view, it's an entirely fragmented um, disjointed system from the players trying to age up from 12 and under to 14 and under, 16 and under, 18 and under, when they go to college, they're an entirely different ranking system, even depending on your different division. And then when you go into pros, you're chasing a whole different set of points. And so um, that's really one of the challenges for the consumer. It's so confusing. And what we're talking about with the Global Tennis Tour is to create a unified, or a, a, an integrated brand so that people all over the world can understand, here's where I find level-based play. And that's really the the change that we're trying to uh, implement. That sounds like a monumental task. Um, but, but equally, I'm sure, given the fact that there are so many people who play tennis worldwide, you know, it's a, uh, it's a very small task for each individual. Um, how do these individuals work together? How is that going to actually work together? Yeah, no, that, that, that's wonderful. Let's, let's take a very small size of tennis people. Let's call it, uh, I'm from Boston, very nice uh, city that people like. And, and let's look at the, how much more easy it is to have accountability and organization around a, let's call it a metropolitan sized ecosystem. Um, it's often said that the only real, uh, the really functioning um, um, size of a democratic institution is a city size where you have a mayor. And uh, whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, if you don't get the snow removed and you don't get the trash off the streets um, and you don't have a good education, you get voted out of office the next time there's an election. 
Um, the problem with well, I, guess, well, I, guess, I guess, I guess, I guess, like like politics, all tennis is local, really. It, exactly, Noel. Thank you very much. Is it it all of local development? Is that's where top players come from? They create an association with a coach that they trust that believes in them, and they have local opportunities to grow. So when we apply a centralized model that works from an administrative point of view, these organizations all build these big national systems that ask players to travel all over the world, and it works. It has national championships and national open championships and ATP futures and ITF juniors, and it's really just causing people to spread out rather than to build together in systems like Volatari's used to be highly productive. Uh, the John Wayne Tennis Club alone in Los Angeles was hugely productive. People came there and they got better every year because they had local opportunities. And now the Junior Tennis Champion Center down in the Washington DC area is very productive because kids stay at home and they develop. And so the, 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 the big challenge for us is how do we return development to local systems? And the only way that we can really do that to provide sufficiently good enough competition is to integrate people across age groups so that we take our college system, which has been hugely productive, and in, reintegrate it in with our top juniors and our top pros, and all the way trickle down to the entry level recreational adult and junior players who would just love to be a part of this system. Fantastic. Um, when, when I've heard in the past of people talking about St. Louis, can, can you explain what that actually means in tennis terms in, in, in a historical context, but also in a, in a metro type context? Sure. So they had a public park, the Dwight Davis Tennis Center, and it was actually named after the person who donated the Davis Cup back in 1900. And players came there, Arthur Ashe, Jimmy Connors, uh, um, Chuck McKinley, uh, a, a whole host of people literally went from St. Louis where they were training daily with each other, they would go to the national championships in the US and from the national championships, they would go right on to Wimbledon and become world-class players. And that's the power of allowing people to have a dense enough package. And also one of the reasons that Europe is so productive because the player density and opportunity that they have. And the only way to recreate that in other parts of the world is to unify different age groups so that we're taking, our juniors are able to take advantage of opportunities, not just to play other juniors, because if we put two 14 year olds together uh, uh, year after year, month after month, they don't get any smarter than 14 year olds. If you put those players together with someone who's been out on the tour or was a great college player, uh, you, you have that 15 year old, 16 year old playing that person weekend after weekend, that person's brain enlarges. And that's really the problem solving, the heavy lifting of player development. And by adopting a points per round system worldwide, we've actually turned kids into sort of sugarholics, is that they really get confused about what development means. Um, we're we're, get, oh, we're so ducking play. Yeah, is it, yeah, is, no. it, is, it fair, is it fair to say, sorry for cutting across you there with the time difference here with the time lag. Um, is it fair to say that, um, that you know, part of the problems are of our own making and they can be also changed. Yes, that's, it's a wonderful point, is that, is that all of this is under our control. Is that 60 years ago, France and other like countries began to adopt their systems toward uh, level-based play. And in many other parts of the world, they didn't change. And so we're, this COVID, in a, in, a, in a very strange way, and I'm gonna use a very strange analogy, but that's not unusual for me, is that after Japan was absolutely devastated after World War II, they had to rebuild all their factories from scratch. And they built them at a world-class, state-of-the-art level. And 15, 16 years later, they were competing with everybody in the world for the quality of their automobiles. This same opportunity is available to us and what GTT is trying to be a part of is to help groups operationalize this building of these metropolitan systems of competition that meet the needs sufficiently for all players from the entry level novice player to the entry level pro where the entry level pro becomes essentially it's like 
it's like stocking a pond with big trout and, and, and all the players in the system come to see if they can catch one of those fish. And all we have to do is make sure that the trout are well fed and have a low lift prize money circuit where those players can earn a regular opportunity and they get enough matches and they get enough money and they have a chance to have a life. And then we begin to recapture a lot of the elements of the Pacific Northwest circuit or the Indian circuit um, around the world. And we can actually do that. Players need it. The health of the game needs it. And this is an opportunity for us to reboot some of the, some of the systems in tennis that have not been um, um, helpful in producing tennis players. I had a, no, I had a scary statistic told me yesterday is that 10 years ago, we introduced UTR in the United States 10 years ago, talking about the benefits of level-based play, and it was obvious to people then. We had 190,000 juniors um, playing tournaments then. Um, now we're losing players. 40% uh, of the players that play one tournament now are not coming back. And our total has gone from 190,000 to 86,000 now. If we can examine what's causing players not to have a great experience, I would suggest that this points per round kind of sugar fest uh, is like eating junk food and, 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 and doesn't inspire people. It really is scary, isn't it? No, we're not getting a great connection here. Could you say it again? I, I'm just, I'm, yeah. I'm just going to repeat that. Sorry about that. Uh, you know, we've gotten so used to fantastic technology, sometimes it lets us down. Um, I, I'm just going to repeat the, the, it sounds really scary that so many kids, you know, I'm sure they're quite talented, you know, try, try their hand at a, at a tournament and then never come back. Yeah. And I, I just think that the tournament experience is not fun. And, and can you hear me? Yes, I can. Hello? Yes, no, we can. I we can, can, can you hear me? Yes. Sorry for this technical difficulty. Okay, sorry. People? Yeah. So, Noel, can you hear us now? Okay, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go on mute and let you continue for a couple of minutes. Great. So, so let's imagine, uh, if we can, that go once... Go ahead, Dave, you continue. Thank you, Noel. Yeah, absolutely. I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. So, let's imagine that in this new COVID world, people are going to be much more resistant to traveling and odds are we're going to be uh, find a lot of people in, in tougher economic shape. And at the same time, we're, we're in, a, in a challenging world where we're looking at equality of opportunity and how do we address the, the huge economic um, disparity between people who could travel in tennis and people who can't travel in tennis. And if we'd really like to revitalize tennis worldwide, we have to make it more accessible and affordable for more people, which means that it has to be local. And once you have this local tennis village idea in the, in the sense that it takes a village to raise a child, there are sufficient resources in a community, whether it's colleges or uh, school facilities, club facilities, uh, uh, there are sufficient facilities and sufficient numbers of people that if clubs begin to collaborate, what we call a sort of metropolitan coalition of clubs, those clubs can offer an inventory of level-based opportunities at every single level, sufficient to meet, meet the needs of, in Boston, for instance, we have 4,000 rated players. And if we can show them a tapestry of opportunities on a regular basis, we've now made it possible, as a friend of mine once said, Dave, can you tell me that if we build this system that I can introduce a player at the, at the age of 10 or nine or 10, who doesn't have a lot of money, can that player stay in Atlanta 
from 10 to 17 until he or she is ready to go off to college. And I said, absolutely. And that's what used to happen in places like St. Louis and Port Washington Tennis Academy where Harry Hoppen, the famous Australian coach was. Uh, and they had all the pros on uh, essentially salaries. So the pros couldn't be pitching a private lesson to a kid that had more money. And so we can build these systems and our group um, with Global Tennis Tour is designed to bring tennis home, to bring these opportunities to the entry level pros so that they can participate in these low level prize money circuits on a regular basis. At the same time, they have a life, but the juniors and the adult players and the former college players uh, and the post tour players can all be part of this very rich tennis banquet locally. And that's really where we will begin to produce more productive systems worldwide. And as Mark Jeffries would be delighted to hear us say, postal code by postal code, because the result is a very, many of you may have heard the term anti-fragile. It's a very robust, almost self-sustaining system that federations could participate in, for instance, on a matching grant. And each system would be able to include hundreds and hundreds more kids who could afford to play certainly giving more opportunity to kids from different backgrounds and without any prejudice for uh, people who have money. There's no discrimination. If you can travel and want to, great. We're trying to suggest a worldwide brand that any consumer, any player, coach, parent could be able to find that's easily identifiable. And I thought I'd just share my screen for a second uh, to, to, uh, to show you this. And bear with me because I'm no, I'm no expert here. It, 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 sounds, it sounds wonderful. I mean, I, I, I imagine a lot of people are wondering why hasn't this happened before and what are the real issues on a local level that are going to cause this to be difficult to make happen? Yeah, well, I think the, the, that's a great question, Noel. Um, when I talk to clubs all over the world, um, so far, there's a common element common element is if a successful club goes to five other clubs and say, hey, let's work together. Those five other clubs are saying, what does that guy have up his sleeve? What, what kind of advantage is he trying to gain on me? Is he trying to steal my players? And so essentially clubs work like tennis players. They, they work competitively with each other and often suspiciously. And what our group is designed to do is to come in as a sort of neutral third party like Sweden and, uh, uh, excuse me, Switzerland, <laughs> and, and show people how to begin to collaborate so that they have a set of operating principles and they have a governance um, ability and they can together begin to put on a banquet that they otherwise individually could never do on their own. And these events all the way up to this summit series, which is this low lift prize money circuit, all the way from the novice entry level kids, these events are all connected. And when these clubs put on an organized palette of events that are not competing against each other, but are rather working collaboratively with each other to sufficiently meet the needs of say 4,000 players in the Boston area, everybody's needs get met. And when everybody's needs get met, those 4,000 people become 4,200 and 4,400 and 5,000 because the families that are participating are saving huge amounts of money, like Noel, who's, you know, if, if he has to travel to an event, it's costing him 1,000 or $2,000 a weekend. That's an insane way to, to basically deploy people's limited resources when we have a better way that's been proven over the history of tennis. No, just, go ahead. Just on, just on that, uh, Dave, there's a couple of, of questions that are coming in. Um, uh, we'll just deal with it in one moment. But uh, the idea behind it is, is obviously this is available for every player, not just the 1% who, who want to be ultra competitive and get to the pro level. This is for all of the recreational players. This is for all of the kids who are, you know, the majority of tennis players. Um, and all of the adults who, who ultimately play tennis for fun 
and because they enjoy playing it. It's not because they want to go to college necessarily. It's also not because they want to go on the tour. You know, the, the 90 something percent, whatever exact numbers they, those are uh, of tennis players who don't, who don't want to be ultra competitive. Does this speak to them and for them? How does this help them? It does. I think this is the whole essence of tennis. If we can't help the foundation of players, the, the people that keep the clubs going, that play on high school teams, if we can't keep them happy and give them a good experience, why should we expect there to be people who actually care enough to provide for the top level to keep existing? And we've seen what's happening to the entry level pros from 200 to 3000. They're basically out of luck. And so we have opportunities like American high school tennis, which is probably 340,000 kids that are playing in high school tennis. So our juniors should have an aspiration to be able to play on their teams, whether it's in America or in Africa or in Australia. And so the beauty of this is that it, it engages people at every level. It provides opportunity in an organized fashion. Um, and and that's, that's, what, that, that's the future of our game right there is giving people like that a great experience. And, Excellent. Yeah. Can I, can I ask you a, a couple of questions then? So there's a specific question that came in from, from one of our listeners in the audience about UTR and, and how, it, um, how it influences behavior among uh, players. Maybe you can just read that and, and try and deal with that question in a moment. Um, but is GTT the same as UTR? And, and how does all of that fit together with other systems that, that may be adopted and, and familiar, more familiar in different parts of the world or different clubs, different environments? How does GTT work with all of that? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So just to, to, to understand a little bit, I was involved in the development of universal tennis heavily for the last nine years. Um, uh, three months ago, um, recognizing Universal was, was, a, was a technology and was continuing to develop, I wanted to get back with a group of people like Noel and our other group um, to develop, to, to address the pain points in tennis, the things that were really making tennis unaffordable, et cetera. So GTT is not, um, is not associated with Universal Tennis, except that we're using at this present time, Universal Tennis is the most accurate and only global rating system that we have. But the difference is in different, uh, the, the World Tennis number uh, should be coming out soon, promoted by the International Tennis Federation. So that any group that wants to work with these principles can apply whatever system they want to, to make these principles work because the level-based play is independent of a certain rating number. Um, France has an elegant system and it works for the French system. And theirs is not UTR, it's not the WTN, it's their own rating system. And as long as it works to get people into the right level of competition, we work with anyone. And, and the beauty, uh, so to address this question from Anouk, um, is that our system, that pathway that I just outlined, is based on level-based advancement. And so when kids are afraid to play because they might lower their UTR, we simply have to educate them that they're, that they're focusing on the wrong things. And this pathway allows them to enter a tournament right at their level, if they're a level seven, they enter it, they play someone that might have just qualified from the previous round, and they play someone that they're at their level in order to earn the chance to advance to play a better player who might only come into the tournament at that later round. Similar to what happens in France in 5, 15,000 tournaments a year. So this is not uh, rocket science. This is simply works better. But what it does do is it gives players a chance to, to we say, you know, get on the horse, ride for a while, get thrown off the horse, pick yourself up and get back in the saddle again. And that's the real hard player development pathway that we kind of, we kind of, um, fool our kids. We say, well, if you just keep getting points, you may think you're getting better, but it's really terribly confusing for kids. And they begin to obsess about, well, what's my rating? And if they do that, then they've really missed the point of what development is. Development is hard work. It's problem solving. It's decision-making. It's playing practice matches. 
And these systems that have been so prolific in the past have been, uh, they've been because they put people together in a community of players that helped each other get better in the same way that players in Sweden back in the 80s and 90s were just, they were a team and they made each other better all the time. And we have to get back to that kind of opportunity initially. Um, so I, I hope I've answered that and, and happy to, uh, to answer other questions. But this is, this is UTR is a number. And it's, it, and it's important that we use the number and not let kids be used by it. Kids need to understand it's simply a reflection of their current level calibrated daily against a million point seven players worldwide. And that the best way to improve your level, if everybody's gonna step around to hit forehands these days, is to learn to hit your backhand down the line or to improve your second serve. And if you do those things and you start to beat players at your level, your rating will go up. Just the same way as if you turn in a quality paper in class, you may get an A. And if you don't get an A, that's not terrible because you may learn how to get an A in the future. And that's the hard lift of development and that we can't hide this, this from our kids. Um, these things are tough and the tougher the things are, the more life lessons they yield. Dave, I just want to interrupt you there because we're coming up close to the end of the presentation. I think there's about five minutes left. Uh, there's a very interesting question there um, that just came in. Um, it's talking to the idea of, of um, you know, a, a wide variety of available players in certain areas. In, in some, there may be more, uh, in, in others, there may be less. How does the Global Tennis Tour accommodate those kinds of differences? And is it able to accommodate those types of differences? Well, so I, if I'm understanding it correctly, and I, I may answer the wrong question here, I know, but. But essentially, there are going to be certain areas of the country that do not have a sufficient density of good players to, uh, to, to, uh, to cause all their juniors to get the necessary competition or any level. But at that highest level, um, it's possible to create through local sponsorships and club owners and people that believe in building this ecosystem of opportunity, which is what we're doing is we're trying to increase socioeconomic opportunities across the board. If we build this through local sponsorships, maybe in cooperation with federations, we can literally import better players to come and be the top dogs in our events. And that's the beauty of being connected with this global tennis tour is that we will be in touch with all these top players around the world, know where they're located, know what it will take to bring them in to run an event at a country club or a local public park. And so we begin to, we, we hope to be the connectors to show those players who would like to have a living at the, at the higher level and would like to, to uh, have a life. We are going to be the connective tissue to connect them with these local metropolitan and regional systems. And Global Excellent. Tennis will, will be essentially a network of connected local systems that can continue to learn from each other, but will each um, learn from their own individual resources, sponsors, patrons, uh, coaches, et cetera. Is, is it fair to say, and I think we should be finishing up in a couple of minutes because there's uh, less than five minutes left. Um, maybe you'll have a couple of uh, closing sentences to kind of explain to everyone uh, in a nutshell. And I think we have another presentation tomorrow to deal with other aspects of the Global Tennis Tour and the issues that come with it. Um, you know, so it, just the question is, um, how does GTT, the Global Tennis Tour, deal with diversity? Well, gee, that's a, it's, a, it's a lovely question. Um, and I've sat on USTA committees for years and years and we keep having diversity committees. How can we get more kids of diverse backgrounds in the game? There is no single lever or opportunity that we have to get people of diverse backgrounds and socioeconomic backgrounds, whether you're talking about African-American players, Hispanic players, white players, Asian players. There's no better way to build a community that actually works respectively 
respectfully with each other than by lowering the economic barriers. That will do more for diversity than anything that we could do uh, worldwide. So imagine the big answer is, uh, many years ago, I looked at this through the famous Archimedes lever, who said, if you give me a lever long enough and a fulcrum, I can lift the world. We believe that when we use the principles of level-based play to increase opportunities everywhere, and we integrate, reintegrate the former players that were great and the college players that were great, and we integrate that into a holistic ecosystem, that there is no bigger movement that could happen than this movement toward level-based play. And, and, and that's the lever and the fulcrum that we need. And I've challenged people over the last 10 years to name a bigger point of leverage that we have to affect the health and, and well-being of tennis and the experience of tennis players around the globe than this. And I would challenge anybody to say, is there a greater opportunity from this? So between the white lines is giving us a platform a way to talk about these issues so that we're saying to federations, look, we're here to help. We're the, uh, we can be the research and development arm of tennis worldwide. And this gives us a podium for expressing these ideas instead of in this kind of disrespectful way on social media. I like this. I don't want to work for that dictator, et cetera, et cetera. And so this is a, this is a way to have a reasonable conversation about how do we all protect and serve this sport that has given us such a wonderful experience in our own lives. So just, I'd like just, to thank everybody for joining. Noel, great questions. Just, uh, just finally, Dave, um, the idea that the Global Tennis Tour will solve all problems, do you see that happening? Well, nothing solves all problems. Um, what we're trying to do is can we create a better experience? Because the best way to, to bring new players into the game is to bring the players that are already in the game, give them a better experience because they will bring their friends. And that's how the first tennis boom happened. It happened all over. It didn't happen because the size of federations having centralized programs. It happened because we had thousands of non-sanctioned events in cities and parks and towns all over the country. And that can happen again. New principles. Fantastic. Thanks. Sound, sounds fantastic. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Thanks, Dave, for your, your knowledge sharing and uh, your ability to uh, bring the points home and really looking forward to this idea taking off. Great. Thanks very Good much. Good luck. Join the team. Thanks. Thank you.